hi, hope you're well. Before we get into this video, I just want to quickly thank Surfshark VPN for helping out by sponsoring this video, and you should check out Surfshark because it's a great VPN. Uh, I recently spent some time traveling through Europe, but I needed my precious AFL fix because I'm a fiend for Aussie rules, and it was so trivially easy to set up and use Surfshark VPN without hassle. Like, whatever platform you're on, it's as simple as opening an app, picking a country, and hitting connect, and there's apps and plugins for all platforms. Uh, Surfshark also allows for an unlimited amount of devices at the same time with just the one super cheap subscription. It's fast, it's reliable, it's widely well regarded, it's a great way to up your security and anonymity online, it's easy to shop internationally or find international streaming services using it, and it's the best VPN that I've ever used, which is why I'm happy to have them on board as a sponsor and why you should check them out. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, and if you click the link below or use code MINIME, you'll get an 83% discount and three months for free. So go check him out and on to the video. The Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay is one of the best licensed video games ever made. And I should know because I play a tragic amount of licensed games. My unwarranted adoration for these often cheaply made, hastily thrown together tie-ins can have me thinking I'm being too charitable to them. Like, I'll question whether I've lowered my bar too much because I'm cheering for the underdog. 24 the game might struggle to hit 24 frames per second and have no original mechanics, but I just really like it. Fast and Furious Crossroads is famously borderline broken, why did I have so much fun with it? This Riddick game though is a whole different beast. It's just fantastic. To me, it comfortably sits among the mid 2000s single player FPS greats like Half-Life 2, Doom 3 and Fear. And I think it'd always be brought up in the same conversations as those games if it wasn't tied to the Riddick name. It's easy to dismiss a piece of media starring Vin Diesel. It shouldn't be, especially after Wheelman, but it is. Now, some of you are probably asking what on earth the Chronicles of Riddick even is. I imagine it needs a quick introduction because it's never really been a successful franchise. So it's a sci-fi film series with three good or mediocre, depending on who you ask, movies that came out between 2000 and 2013. Pitch Black, The Chronicles of Riddick, and Riddick. Not confusing at all. Diesel plays brooding tough guy anti-hero Richard B. Riddick, or Dick Riddick, hilarious, and at times the franchise is a sprawling space opera, and at others it's more of a reined in sci-fi thriller. By all reports, the franchise is Diesel's pet project. He seems to be more into it than anyone else, and as such, he's helped get a short animated film and motion comics based on this series off the ground, as well as a mobile game and two fully-fledged high-budget video game releases, starting with The Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay in 2004 for the Xbox, later ported in 2005 to the PC, the version you're seeing. And in a lot of ways, this feels like it came out way later than 2004. Of course, the graphics deserve a shout, running on a proprietary engine with Doom 3-esque bump mapping and dynamic lighting, but a lot of stuff about its design is so ahead of its time. Uh, the first person hand-to-hand -hand combat still feels as intuitive and punchy as any modern game, pardon the pun. Uh, the way Riddick will occasionally mumble his thoughts to himself while you're playing to help you out is something that has since become a big trend, as has blending firefights, stealth, and climbing together to create an action game. And the execution here is quite effortless. Darkness. I can hide the bodies here. The first time you take control of Riddick, you'll notice how he casts a shadow, how you can see his body when you look down, and how he has a slight head bob while moving, giving him this lumbering physical presence. Landing outside Butcher Bay, a notorious prison in which Riddick is to be held, if you disobey orders and try to run away, you're greeted with a sandstorm and a minefield. If you try to fight the guard, you'll be shot down, and if you try to run towards the prison, the turrets out the front will mercilessly mow you down without hesitation. Hesitation. There's no invisible walls, no instant game over screens, no jarring video game logic to break the illusion. Instead, there's a clear focus on realizing Butcher Bay and Riddick's presence in it. You aren't a floating camera flying around in an FPS game, you are Riddick and this is a brutal prison. 
The heads up display is minimal, mainly serving to show your health, and it fades in and out when necessary, so instead the game will use in-world cues to convey information. Riddick raises his hands when you can go for a stealth kill, ammo remaining in a clip is shown on the gun model, the field of view widens and a slight vignette comes in while sneaking, and a blue colour filter washes over when you're sneaking in the shadows, indicating that no one can see you. You're made to think through the eyes of Riddick. There's no damage numbers or enemy health bars or x-ray vision to see through walls. It's all about using the environment around you. You'll be taking mental notes of where shadows are, of where light sources are, of how much noise you're making. You'll be listening for where enemies are and keeping track of where health stations or certain NPCs are in the back of your mind. It's about thinking like you're in this environment. So clearly the hard to nail down, often overused as a buzzword idea of immersion was at the core of Escape from Butcher Bay's design, breaking down as many video gamey barriers as possible in an effort to place you in Riddick's shoes. Uh, dialogue leans into spoken grammar and swearing rather than overwritten or quippy language, and it's delivered convincingly by a Hollywood cast starring the likes of Diesel, Zibit, Ron Perlman, Cole Hauser, and Michael Rooker. What a list. Uh, none of whom sound like they're phoning it in. No contraband of any kind. Don't ask what's contraband. I define it day by day. Diesel especially, with how much he cares about this character, really does a stellar job at personifying him and his ultra bassy voice. Plus 50? Now come on, Johns. Greed is an ugly thing. You're in no position to negotiate, Riddick. Every location in Butcher Bay is justified, whether you're in a cell, the guards' quarters, or the mines down below, they all exist because, again, this is a prison rather than a big video game level. We crave escapism in video games, and all these little design decisions add up to draw you into Butcher Bay's convincing illusion. Uh, this concept of immersion serves as the base that the rest of the game is built on top of, as an undercurrent that bolsters every other aspect of it, and this is the sort of thing that you would rarely see in 2004. It became a lot more popular years later in games like Far Cry 2 and the Metro series. The world building here is just fantastic. A lot of restraint is shown, it, it takes a long time before you actually get to wield a gun. Instead you spend time imprisoned doing favours for inmates in return for shivs or information, and getting in fights with gangs and corrupt guards, complete with a quest log, dialogue trees, and a basic currency system. Uh, early on the game feels more like an RPG or an immersive sim than anything else. It's, it's very confident in its own pace and bold in tone and direction. The more time you spend in Butcher Bay, the more brutal it reveals itself to be, and the more increasingly obvious it becomes just why the place breeds violence. Uh, there are no women in the prison at all, no one trusts anyone, there's no reprieve from the sunburnt courtyards or the grimy cells, guards only ever demonize inmates, and a handful of inmates have entirely lost their minds. Everything is so consistently harsh and masculine from start to finish. Like, even the Half-Life style healing stations look painful as they stab these massive needles into Riddick. It just never ever lets up. There's a point in the game where you find yourself in the guards' quarters and you discover that while they live in nicer conditions than the inmates, they aren't much nicer. Their living situation also resembles a prison. Uh, shared open bathrooms and showers, small identical apartments stacked next to each other that are accented with harsh metal panels, and a depressing, rundown, not even bare minimum recreational space with one pathetic plant feature in the middle. Uh, the guards, like the inmates, don't get any R&R &R in this place either. It's a miserable insight into the culture at Butcher Bay. It's no wonder this place has devolved into this desperate primal combative hell, and it's never explicitly pointed out in dialogue how bad the guards' quarters are. It's just something that you'll observe while playing, and it's one of the many subtle layers that compounds and strengthens the believability of this world. And then later on you'll see that those who run the prison live in this very regal, extravagant penthouse area, which also speaks for itself and paints a picture of a toxic hierarchy. How the game characterises Riddick himself is handled with the same nuance. 
An opening dream sequence serves as a tutorial for all the game's mechanics on the surface, but it also establishes that even on a subconscious level, all Riddick thinks and dreams about is escaping the prison at any cost. Uh, deep down in his psyche, he is still unfazed by killing anyone in his way, whether they're innocent or not, he's just going to escape. Which is the perfect violent video game protagonist to play as. Uh, you don't have to consolidate with the fact that he's just murdering his way through like you would a Nathan Drake or a Lara Croft. It's just what this character does. And alongside everything else, this contributes to the believability and immersion of it all. It's all so cleverly constructed and it all complements itself. Now I've sort of neglected to talk about how this game actually plays or dive into how the mechanics really work because they need to be examined under the context of the rest of the game. Uh, immersion being at the core of how this game is designed really goes a long way in supporting these mechanics because Frankly, in isolation, they're nothing special. Uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, sneak through the shadows, shooting out lights and taking out guards from behind. Uh, go for headshots, circle strafe and use cover to reload. Uh, climb over ledges and crouch through vents and punch and block your way through fistfights. Uh, the firefights look cool, but the guns are lighter and less punchy than you'd hope, they really don't aim punch enemies like they should, and movement speed is just slightly slow enough to be irritating. Uh, these days it feels really in need of a sprint button. Combat in general can be a bit clumsy and unwieldy at times. But by the time you get to the shootouts, they're made to feel special. They feel momentous, they feel powerful. Uh, you've been immersed into this world as just another inmate negotiating and scrapping it out between gangs, an inmate getting abused by guards like everyone else, and eventually you found your way to a weapon, a real way to fight back. And just as the shootouts or any other section starts to become stale, you're doing something new. One moment you're in a fight club, the next you're in a horror game, the next you're sneaking by the nearly impossible to kill mech suit mini bosses, the next it's more like an RPG or an adventure game, and suddenly it's a platformer. Uh, the blend of mechanics feels natural, and every mechanic is competent enough and supported by a strong enough level design to keep you engaged and keep you digging to learn more about this prison. Uh, on the rare occasion it does grow a bit tired, a big underground mine section towards the end definitely leads leave something to be desired as you sort of get lost going back and forth trying to follow vague quest instructions, uh, I still found myself so immersed and invested that I was just itching to see it through. The stealth mechanics, while simple, are the most realised. We learn in this game how Riddick can see in the dark and the answer is magic, I guess, and uh, as a result you can press a button for night vision. Uh, walking around in the pitch black darkness, pardon the pun, taking out lights and enemies one by one really makes you feel like Dick Riddick. And the hard edged dynamic lighting shadows that don't really represent how light works in real life because they shouldn't be that dark, like light would definitely bleed through and this lighting was absolutely like this because of tech limitations at the time, aid this stealth gameplay perfectly. Uh, if you didn't know any better, they'd feel like an artistic choice. Another design decision that's fun to think about is how the game gradually gets easier and easier as you play it. It starts out very hard, you'll die a lot, but as you play your max health gradually increases, and by the end it's happy to throw you in a mech suit and let you mow down everyone in your path. This works in parallel with Riddick learning his way around the prison. You start as a powerless nobody, literally restrained and unable to move freely, and you end by stomping on guards like they're nothing. It's a power trip where Riddick proves himself to be the manliest man of all the men with the bassiest voice, and the finale can feel a bit more mindless and hollow than all the clever setup towards the beginning, but it's at least cathartic and well earned. It's over a bit too soon too, taking about 7 hours to beat. The first half of the game is certainly more compelling than the second half where the final act sort of feels like a reminder that Riddick isn't a highbrow franchise with profound allegories, it's schlocky sci-fi starring the Fast and Furious guy. Uh, this game almost feels too smart for this franchise. That's not to say it isn't a flawed game. Uh, aside from the less impressive finale and some small gameplay hiccups, the cutscenes, whether they're the brief cuts to show Vin pressing a button or climbing a ledge, or they're the lengthier cutscenes, probably should have remained in first person to maintain the illusion. They're jarring every time, and the longer cutscenes aren't particularly well directed. 
Cigarette packets are lying around as collectibles, which reward you with behind the scenes content in the main menu, which again pulls you out of the experience too much. It's especially annoying when a side quest rewards you with one of these instead of something useful to you in game, like a weapon or currency or information. But these issues pale in comparison to everything else Escape from Butcher Bay achieves. I open this video by saying that this is one of the best licensed games ever made, and I hope I've somewhat justified why I think that is, but it's also worth examining where this stands in the world of licensed games. Uh, most will retell a film in a shoddier way, or feel like a non-canon side adventure for James Bond, or act as a bonus season for Jack Bauer, and rarely will they add to these franchises in any meaningful way. Uh, sure, they might occasionally fill in some plot holes or flesh out a side character, but they're nearly always novelties. They're video game versions of the real thing, failing to feel like the real thing themselves. Escape from Butcher Bay, on the other hand, overcomes this. This is as valid an entry into this franchise as any film. It came out alongside the Chronicles of Riddick movie, but by electing to tell the prequel story of Butcher Bay, a story acknowledged in the films, and by telling it so remarkably well, it earns its position as an essential piece of this franchise. It makes you buy into this universe, and it remains an incredibly thoughtful and well-constructed game. Its legacy, though, hasn't quite matched its quality. Review scores were stellar, it won plenty of awards, it put its Swedish developer Starbreeze on the map, and you can clearly see a through line of Butcher Bay's influence in their following games like The Darkness and The Syndicate reboot, but it didn't sell as well as they or their publisher Vivendi hoped, which was especially troubling as Starbreeze apparently had to downsize from 80 employees all the way down to 25 while Riddick was under development. It's a wonder this turned out as well as it did. Despite everything, it didn't stop a sequel in 2009 from releasing called Assault on Dark Athena, a sequel that included a very welcome graphics remaster of Butcher Bay packaged in, but it appears Dark Athena didn't make much of a splash either, nor did it impress critics in the same way. With the Riddick franchise's track record of bombing, it's safe to pin down both games' lack of success on the license's failure to garner mass appeal, along with the skepticism surrounding licensed games. It doesn't help that it's a bit of a pain to play these games these days too. Being stuck on old consoles or marred by DRM and compatibility issues on PC, uh, your best bet is to pirate a now delisted GOG version of either game and Google your way into fixing it. Which leaves Escape from Butcher Bay in a bit of a funny place. Uh, most who've played it will agree it's every bit as stellar as the best FPS games of its era, but finding anyone who's played it is rare, so it's faded further into obscurity than it probably should have, always sort of floating around as this word of mouth gem, occasionally bobbing its head in the odd article or YouTube video like this. It's a fantastic game, and you could argue that it's the best use of a license by any video game to date. Keeping in mind that it may never have been greenlit without the license, the sad irony to The Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, despite how great it is, is that its biggest undoing was using the license to begin with. And there we wrap up the video. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Do all the algorithm stuff if you want to support, or you can support on Patreon uh, and get these videos ad free along with a few other things and get your name at the end here. Thank you everyone coming up. Um, I have a second channel that I should shout out more. Someone commented on a video over there telling me I should advertise it more. So, hey, I have a second channel. I do Q&As over there. Uh, you should go check that out. A link is in the description. Um, what else should I say? I mention, I mention immersion a lot uh, in my videos. I think it's something I seem to appreciate a lot. Um, I've talked about it with the Mafia series and with, uh, and with King Kong. Um, it's sort of a, a vague, airy game design concept, uh, but it, it, it is something that charms me very easily, and I, I recognize that I talk about it a lot. Um, I'll also think about reviewing the sequel, uh, Assault on Dark Athena, sometime. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching, as usual. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye.